Good evening. This is a, a commentary I want to make on a letter that was submitted to the General Assembly by uh, the United Kingdom on January 22nd of this year, 2021. It's a commentary, it's a critique of this uh, letter uh, regarding the question of the Falkland Islands or the Malvinas Islands as it is called in the Spanish world. Letter dated January 14th, 2021, from the permanent representative of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to the United Nations Address to the Secretariat General. Annex to the letter, I guess this is an annex or um, an, an update, perhaps, to the letter dated January 14th from the permanent representative of the United Kingdom. And so I will read it out loud and I will give my, um, my opinion, my criticism, my analysis of what is being said. It may not, it may not always sound very formal, I apologize. I will try to stick to the body of the letter as much as pos possible. It is not that long, actually. It's just like two, three, four, five, six paragraphs. Um, the United Kingdom is clear about both the historical and legal position on the sovereignty of the Falkland Islands. No, it says, no civilian population was expelled from the Falkland Islands on January 3rd, 1833. Okay. This is not true. <laughs> um, they play, the United Kingdom, London, plays this, and it's, I, it's very telling, actually. Um, their defense reveals a lot of what they consciously know they're trying to paint over. They um, arrived on the islands when they heard the Argentinians were uh, becoming more, more settled or they were making good on maintaining a settlement that had been attacked by the Americans three uh, three years before, one year before, actually, I'm sorry, two years before that. Um, so they realized they were losing. See, the United Kingdom was not settled on the Falkland Islands, on the Malvinas. The Malvinas were uh, considered by the empires of the day. Pretty much the common consens consensus was that it fell within the jurisdiction of the Spanish. The Spanish were not settled there until 1771 or 72, and at the same time, around the same time or a year before that, the British had tried to establish a settlement on the other island, and um, the ones that were there were the French. The French had a proper settlement called Port Louis, where today Stanley is. And the Spanish protested because they said, you know, the Pope determined that this whole part of the world, the Portuguese and us agreed, was part of where the Spanish realm and all of that part of South America fell within uh, Spanish right to claim um, conquest and colony. The French conceded to this and the Spanish paid for their troubles. So Port Egmont, which was the British fort on the Western Island, and Porto Soledad, which was what Port Louis, Port Louis became on the Eastern Island, pretty much started off at the same time. And it didn't last too long because as soon as the Spanish found out that the, the British were on the other island, they said, no, you guys should know this is our area, our part of the world. 
So they they were kicked out. They fought, um, and troops were sent from Buenos Aires because in 1771, 1776, in that whole period, the Spanish were uh, had taken up South America except for the Brazilian part with Spanish provinces. The Malvinas were administrated from Buenos Aires. They were Spanish. But the ones that were in charge of of that part of the world uh, were the people from Buenos Aires. So, in fact, they sent people from the Argentine region, from Buenos Aires, to fight and expel the British. They were expelled. And then something funny happened. You know, they left and they came back. Um, there was some sort of agreement, secret agreement, and then they left again. All in all, the British never really settled. They tried to come back for another year or two, and then they abandoned the, the what they called the Falklands. And yes, they had explorers that had been there. But the whole issue here that nobody wants to talk about is that sovereignty is rightfully established by settlement, by effective occupation, ongoing occupation. You can't be sitting in your throne and say, well, you know, we declare that that part of the world is ours. And so send a boat to land on the beach and leave a bronze plaque and yeah, well, don't, not worry about it anymore. And it's ours. That's not how it's supposed to be. Eventually figure that out. This is a very small planet to be shared by pretty soon 8 billion people. And it seems ridiculous that... Britain feels it has more right than the other countries of the planet to say, well, most of Antarctica is ours and that part of the Atlantic is ours and, you know, we have and blah, 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 we have this right and that right. And they, and um, in any case, they left the Falklands and the Falklands were pretty much too hard to access, too inhospitable. But the people of Buenos Aires... Um, considered their, them part of uh, a territory they were inheriting informally from what used to be Spanish-run part of the world. And the Spanish did have uh, a presence on and off on those islands after the British left. They continued making good on their claim to um, for these islands to be theirs. The English did not. The English left. Uh, because they didn't really want to hassle, they, they weren't that important to them. You know, the Spanish prevailed and they just let it go on that way. In 1820, the Argentinians had already broken from the Spanish and they were already feeling they were inheriting whatever was left by the Spanish. And they sent somebody called David Hewitt who raised the Argentine flag on the Malvinas and claimed them for Argentina in 1820. And there was a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of uh, um, events and other, uh, other statements and other things that happened regarding Argentina's well-intended um, inclusion of the Malvinas as part of what was becoming Argentina because they already were being run from Buenos Aires. Now the British skip over all of that. They they just go straight to 1833 and they say something about a garrison about an event about a garrison that was sent by Arge the Argentinians when they uh, you know Another part that is never talked about is that this was like no man's land. Whalers and sealers would go and just camp out and hunt whales and seals and uh, of all countries, of Germany, Holland, British, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, and when the Argentinians started becoming serious about the islands, 1820, 1822, and so forth, Eventually, they sent, I believe in 1827, a guy named uh, Vernet, Louis Vernet, um, to represent Argentina's intention of uh, commercializing and uh, 
legalizing, giving order, giving administration to these islands that were run by nobody. Um, except, of course, Br the British claim from their little throne all the way on the other half of the world, saying, you know, that, that should be ours. Now, it's easy to tell the Argentinians who are struggling to build their new nation and to bully them and, 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 and feel that you can confront them and push them off need need come if it ever came to that um but this is something that i will talk about later so vernet trying to uh be serious about yes vernet then another thing that will be mentioned later maybe i should read on is that um okay yeah let me read on because i will eventually have to touch on this later on an Argentine military garrison had been sent to the Falcon Islands three months earlier in an attempt to impose Argentine impose the selection of words is really funny, you know, because what the British want to convince the world of is that Argentina is trying to sneak in there. You know, they don't they don't want the picture to be seen that they already had these islands on their lap. And they were just really trying to formalize their country and, and bring a rightful administration to islands that they felt were no greater right of any nation than of their own because of the virtue that they had come from the Spanish Empire. Um, in any case, um, the United Kingdom immediately protested and later expelled the Argentine military garrison in 1833. Okay. Why did, were they able to expel the garrison? For one thing, they were left, uh, they were attacked and left in, in, in you know, the, the uh, American Silas Duncan got upset in 1831 because Vernet um, had, um, you know, had fined some what he considered illegal whaling on behalf of the Argentine government and sequestered ships, you know, and asked for a fine or whatever they did. And it was a whole incident. And the United States, instead of respecting that this country was claiming administration and and political inclusion of the islands, decided to say that it was illegitimate, that it was they had no right to do that. Now, where does the United States draw any authority in saying that Argentina has a right or does not have a right to any land. They weren't British. In fact, after Silas Duncan came back and um, revengefully blew to bits Puerto Soledad, uh, Puerto Luis at this point called by the Argentinians, he declared now they're back to being no man's land. That's what Silas Duncan himself said. So he acted out of revengeful scorn. Uh, you know, he decided that this, because the, the new Spanish republics, having been provinces of the Spanish Empire, were seen with the same prejudice that we still to this day, in fact, we later carried on to attack Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Philippines, Mexico, we stole half of Mexico, because of this assumption uh, fueled and, 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 uh, and, uh, and fostered by uh, this inherited idea of prejudice and bigotry against the Spanish. And so the Spanish provinces were not seen. Well, the Spanish republics were trying to uh, be like Europe and like America and, and create their republics and so forth and, and dealt with the devil, which is a whole other subject they should have been strong in themselves instead they trusted the british they trusted the americans they trusted the french and then these would turn around and and try to use them and manipulate them or invade their territories and they never learned because in the 70s they continue treating you know the americans uh, trained them to attack their own people during the subversive war in the 1970s and so they keep it's not a whole other problem but it was what i'm trying to say is that it was already already going on all the way back then. Um, you know, and I keep thinking of Biden because I remember when the war on the, on the islands occurred in 1982, 
And Biden was asked, was interviewed, and he simply said, of course, we're going to stand by the British, as if a Latin American country was one of the access powers that we have to make sure we ally with Britain against. He had no knowledge, and I'm pretty certain that Biden had no knowledge of what really happened in 1831 on the islands and how much the Argentinians rightfully felt the islands were part of the territory they were inheriting inheriting and turning into becoming Argentina. And they had no sense. No, he just kind of um, shallowly decided that because the British are like our people, we should be on their side, or because the British is an ally, we should look at Latin, the Latin American country as an enemy. <laughs> when did any Latin American country attack a British uh, the British or the Americans? No Latin American country ever uh, declared, you know, uh, Cuba had some, but these are all things that were provoked by the United States. I mean, we have never been, the Spanish world has never been hostile against, and yet America and Britain cannot help this old, old way of looking at the Spanish, and therefore their politics and their policies reflect something that definitely does, would, does not have the same temper and attitude that a political policy would have towards the Dutch or towards the Scandinavians or towards the Canadians or towards the British or, you know, uh, there is this predisposition. As an American, I know this because I, I can hear how my own culture talks and I can, you know, like anticipate the kind of rationale that will be directed politically. And so let's see what happens now that Biden won the presidency. Uh, but, you know, rich, a rich, educated background regarding Spanish, uh, the history of the Spanish Empire and how the, uh, the South American republics were actually shaped and formed is not really what prevails in his rationale. And so, um, you know, it's hard to imagine how our government is going to be fair and just towards the, the right for independence, equality, and liberty that Bolivia has, that Venezuela has, that Honduras has, when it's all about trying to control and manipulate the destiny of these countries all the time. And they can't, we can't seem to uh, unglue ourselves uh, from this prejudice, this, 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 this subliminal hate towards things that derive from the Spanish Empire. Um, the civilian population who had previously sought and received British permission to reside on the islands were encouraged to remain. That is not true either. Vernet had dealt with the British and had requested things from the British, though he was being sent by Argentina in 1831, um, for reasons that you would have to be in those days to understand. Um, for one thing, we're talking about like comparing the, the might of a, a military power today compared to a little country like Costa Rica or Panama. I mean, you're going to try to not make the, the powerful bullies upset and those that are saying those islands are ours, you know, you, you know you're not going to be too defiant against, uh, in fact, the British tried invading Argentina right before, the few years before it became its own nation in 1806 and 1807. So the Argentinians already come with a history of being victimized. Uh, later, the French and the British tried to invade again and because they felt that they have a right to the Paraná River. And they there was involvement and intervention, just like today, and not letting these countries sort themselves out through their own spirit, their own culture. They, If they could divide when Uruguay was having problems with Brazil and you know, they were really part of Argentina, of what was the, the, the vice royalty of La Plata, or practically was on route to becoming one nation, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay. 
and these wars that happened uh, for some, you know, there were the British always. The British had intentions in Paraguay. They armed the Brazilians, the Argentinians, the Uruguays, uh, the Uruguayans against Paraguay. Then they they mediated between Brazil and Argentina about Uruguay and helped it become its own country, when in reality it could have just as easily been one country, Argentina and Uruguay. It seemed to make more sense had the British not been involved. And this is an intrinsic part of South American history. Everywhere you look, there are the British. But it's reciprocal because the South Americans lack the self-confidence to say, you know what, let's not really trust a, a power, a military power like the British because they're going to try to take advantage of us. Let's do our own thing. Let's go study in Spain. Let's go study maybe in other countries or let's just concentrate on building our own, uh, you know, school of thought in our own countries and make ourselves. They unfortunately bought into the... You know, it's the same thing is happening today, basically, um, with countries in Africa, in Asia, in Middle East to a great extent, South America. You know, they they want to catch up, and so part of them really believe, innocently believe that we must do and and, and emulate what the leaders, the powerful ones, do. And what do they do? They try to take advantage for themselves, use and manipulate you. And this letter. <laughs> oozes of of um of 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 how f how aware britain is that it's lying okay um we're encouraged to the majority the majority voluntarily chose to do so well i don't think that is true either because what probably really happened is that the british were really interested in people staying on the islands. Nobody wanted to stay on these islands. Things got tough really quick there. And, um, you know, as soon as it got difficult, it became hell. And so it was, you know, the Argentinians had taken it to a certain level. There were cows, there were, there were, there were buildings, there were, you know, people coming and being received by the Argentine administration. And the Americans came and destroyed that. And a year later, you know, they told the British, "Hey, you know, now they're now we've we've leveled the place. It's your it's your chance to take the islands back." Now we it'd be interesting to investigate what is actually the truth there between the United States and Britain. What kind of cahoots were going on there? Why was Silas Duncan interested in informing the British that he had just decimated Puerto Soledad? And giving the uh, giving the the, the go ahead for the British to easily take the islands from Argentina, and then be able to say, well, you know, the people accepted us and they didn't put up a fight. Well, they were probably hungry. They were probably, if anything, the Argentinian the Argentinian courageously tried to build up. You know, immediately they tried to they sent another governor. They tried to start up the settlement again. And in the midst of, in the midst of this Argentinian Argentina trying to rebuild the islands, the British easily go with a couple of ships and some cannons and say, "Hey, look at our warships out there! Uh, you know, lower your Argentinian flag." Well, of course, what did they? Ex what this this is where the, manip the, the 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 manipulation of history occurs. Um, the reasons for why things happen a certain way were completely different to what, for example, this letter would want you to believe, or in this case, wants the United Nations to believe. Um, the, ma the majority voluntarily choose to do so. In 1833, the territorial borders of the, Ar of the Republic of Argentina did not include the geographical southern half of its present form, nor any territory in the Falkland Islands, Antarctica or South Georgia and um, the South Sandwich Islands, which is the description of what the Argentinians claim. Well, you know, so what? I mean... Patagonia was conquered like America conquered the West, and yet it still isn't true um, because the Malvinas were much more part of what would become Argentina than Patagonia even was because they, they were in the jurisdiction, they were contained within the jurisdiction of Buenos Aires 
And the people of Buenos Aires were Spanish, were Spanish that stayed there and decided they wanted to have their own country. So there's a continuity. There's a continuity of Spanish people who knew the islands were Spanish, who stayed in Argentina, where from where from which the islands were being run and administrated. They themselves became Argentinians and Creoles, created Argentina, and so they brought with them Malvinas. Uh, though, and, and this letter wants to paint it as if it was an idea that just occurred to to the Argentinians. They wanted Patagonia, and they also wanted Malvinas. No, it wasn't like that. Uh, there were ships coming and going between Montevideo, Montevideo, Buenos Aires, and Malvinas at different times. Okay. And uh, the, the history, the knowledge, the social knowledge, political social knowledge of the people were very much aware that these islands were part of their, you know, when it was Spain, it was part of them. And when it became Argentina, it was still part of them because they stayed on creating Argentina. They brought with them the islands. So the British want to paint a very different picture, and they want to fool that, you know, if the United Nations was a person, I would be offended. <laughs> I would be insulted because one of the members that is supposed to uh, f make, you know, construct the form of the United Nations is trying to use the United Nations, is trying to lie to the United Nations. For example, um, well, what comes later, the, the British overseas territories and the right to self-determination, come on, <laughs> whose interests, uh, who wants these territories? These people are uh, dependent on the British. They do whatever the British know how to work the situation. It's The British use the, the, the political notion of self uh, determination and dependence that are so seductive to the to the human mind through this political construct of British overseas territories to basically fool the United Nations in into making it seem like these islanders are endowed with their own with their own right uh, with their own sovereign right with their own right to do what they please with the islands. These were people that were brought there precisely to strengthen. Uh, the British position against Argentina, who never stopped protesting. As soon as the, Arge the British took the islands from the Argentinians, immediately, they, from that day on, they've always said, you just took the islands from us. The British always ignored this, always ignored Argentina's right to be respected and heard and, and, and negotiated with over an altercation that should of uh, abuse of abuse of power that should never have, have happened. On top of it, they have the nerve to, to, um, to establish commerce and collaboration and supposed friendship with Argentina. And at the same time, it's almost like saying, um, you know somebody you stole something from, or they say that you took something that belonged to them. And you pretend that they're not protesting, and you say, "Well, let's go. Let's go to the movies, anyways. Let's be friends." I mean, I would. You would feel insulted. Anybody would feel insulted if you continue to act as if we're okay when, in reality, we have a problem stewing underneath. And this has been going on by the time the Falklands Malvinas War happened in 1982. It had been 150 years of this situation. In fact. Right before that war, the British were trying to find ways of, of of maybe appeasing the Argentinians, of creating some kind of maybe they felt it was they were chewing more than they could, uh, they were biting more than they could chew, and some politicians felt that way in London, and there there was talk, there were negotiations to see if they could do a lease back. All of a sudden, none of that happened. And they're saying these islands, have, it's a complete fabrication. They're saying that these islands have always been ours. So why were there, why have British diplomats and um, I think it was a lord that, you know, there's documents by the British themselves that say, hey, you know, I don't know really just how British these islands are. And I don't think we're doing things the right way. I think, you know, they kind of know that they abused a country that could not defend themselves, that they 
took something without it being theirs entirely. But they, they want to, it wouldn't surprise me that they have burned documents. Anyways, you know, that there are secrets that are being, you know, shut, buried. Um, the land that now forms the Argentine province of, province of Tierra del Fuego, of which the uh, Republic of Argentina purportedly claims the Falkland Islands forms part of, did not itself form part of the Argentine Republic until approximately half a century later, 1880 or something. Uh, by which time the current Falklands people lived and raised two generations on the Falklands. British sovereignty over the Falkland Islands dates back to seven. I can't believe the amount of, of, of fabrication that it goes into a document that is presented to the United Nations. Uh, British sovereignty over the Falkland Islands dates back to 1765, some years before the Argentine Republic. So they want to say that everything the Argentinians say is, is just doesn't make sense. Yes, the Argentinians included Malvinas in the territory of Tierra del Fuego after the fact, after the dispute had started, before it was part of Buenos Aires. The islands were part of Buenos Aires. So they used this move by the Argentinians to, to solidify the administration in some kind of comprehensive way. I always felt that they should just be their own province. They would have been their own province, probably, had the British not never gotten involved. Uh, they would Today, they would probably just be an Argentine province. But so they, they, they play with the dates in order to make it appear as if Argentina did everything later after the fact to try to catch up with something that never there it was never their right. Well, you know, manipulation. Manipulation is to me a, a big reason to be offended and discredit what somebody claims. We'll see what the United Nations does with this letter. Um, by which time the Falkland Islands people that lived and raised two generations of okay, then it says British sovereignty over the Falkland Islands dates back to 1765. Not true. That is a lie. The islands immediately, they said, you know, okay, we saw them, you know, the, we claimed them for the, the, the king or what have you, and that's it. <laughs> they just sailed off. It turns out that the Spanish said, well, you know, you can claim all you want, but Portugal and I agreed that this part of the world is mine. We bought the settlement from the French in 1771. Um... You know, you may have put your settlement on the other island, but you left it. <laughs> so if anything, if anything, you could say, well, then perhaps the island should be half British, half Spanish, half Argentinian, half, um, half British, where the British would have been on the Western island and the Argentinians on the Eastern island. In fact... The British never settled uh, Stanley before they took the islands from Argentina. They were never on the eastern island. They only had Port Egmont for like three years. When they fought the Spanish, they abandoned Port Egmont. So they weren't sovereign on the, on the islands. They left the islands. They decided they weren't that important. They abandoned Port Egmont. They uh, lost to a Spanish confrontation with the Spanish. And they did not fight to keep the islands. Did they not start protesting and said, you know, those are our islands, get off our islands, you know, we're coming back, or anything like that. They weren't sure they wanted to have the fuck. That's the whole thing about empires, that they want to claim things just in case. <laughs> they feel that they have more right to the world than other nations. That's the That's why... Um, politically, the world started seeing the problem with colonization and empires and and how that went against the notion of free, independent, equal republics, uh, which rightfully populate the, the world in their own right. 
it's like Britain is stuck in in the past. It it still pre believes that it, uh, first first served first first you know first they can claim first dibs to places. They feel they can have half of Antarctica because they sent scientific explorers there, or they built a South Bay. They on one hand they want to make sure other countries don't get cocky about claiming Antarctica, so they pushed the United Nations to create a scientific treaty where nobody can claim Antarctica. But in the meantime, America and Britain kind of like, you know, grow their bases. They <laughs> Audaciously, the British uh, just had a, the Falkland Islanders had a, a thing on, on the internet with, uh, the, I don't know what, Ministry of Development or Agriculture or something. I don't know. There were a bunch of representatives. And all they talked about was how the the Falklands can be a, a launching base or a center, a hub to administrate Antarctica and the South Atlantic from. And this shows you the mentality that London still lives in. They still feel that if they get there first, move away other countries and other populations and the rest of the world. This is ours. You know, elbow everybody out. We got there first and we're able to do that because we have a stronger army and we have more money and you need to be in good economic relationship with us. So we get to exploit that and grab more of the world for ourselves. The world has 8 billion people. And Argentina is a country that has 44 million people still trying to, you know, get its act together. You know, wars today are not about defending your your sovereign right. It's all about exploiting the weaker, isn't aren't they? I mean, look at all the wars that are going on today. Who, when has Britain or America been attacked by any Middle Eastern country or South American country? And yet look at the way they... They bitch slap Bolivia, Cuba, Venezuela, um, South America. They were behind the killing of Allende, you know, in Chile. And, uh, it's incredible. The war is no longer the, the art of, of the courageous. It's the art of the manipulating cowards. They see, they, they see where there's an opportunity or where somebody won't be able to defend their own sovereignty. And that's when, so that's what the South Atlantic is. The only con contention that Britain has about the South Atlantic's resources in Antarctica and Malvinas, and they even have their eye on Patagonia. They care about good relationships with, with Argentina because they could still uh, one day maybe turn it around and, 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 and start saying that, you know, we have some right to Patagonia. Don't It's not so far-fetched. Some British people actually believe that because for whatever reason they were involved in, in the when when Chile and Argentina were were taking shape they feel they have first dibs for every single part of the world it's insane it's absolutely insane and empires are long gone <laughs> and this is the only country that still talks about other nations with with um with condescendence, you know, with like saying us, what we want and our rights and what we expect from you. And the United States does the same thing, you know, but these two countries are out of control. Anyways, um, the land that is now approximately half a century. What is the generations? Okay. Next paragraph. The United Kingdom's relationship with the Falkland Islands so this is where they try to make it seem like there's two, it's two different things. The Falkland Islands, or the Malvinas, and Britain. Why? I'll explain why. I call it the three cup trick. If you create a situation where there's a dynamic of three, me, you, and a third arguer, let's say, you can always say, well, we're only defending what they want, what they have a right to. And if that other second party just stays put and goes along and cahoots with what the first one is saying, before the world, they can make it look 
like the third party, Argentina, is being abusive against these, this poor little second party to which Britain can act all noble and righteously pretend it's defending it, when in reality, it's its own interest. <laughs> that second element is its own interest, but it makes it look like something separate. The United Kingdom's relationship with the Falkland Islands and all of its overseas territories is a modern one, yeah, based, this is all the stuff that London wants the world to, how London wants the world to understand it, to understand its policy and the things that it does politically, militarily, etc. Uh, is a modern one based on partnership, really, <laughs> of equal partnership. Shared values and the right of the people of each territory to determine their own future. See, this is see where the trick is. The United Kingdom government attaches great importance to the principle and the right of self determination. And this is now it's going to talk about what the United, what the function, how the United Nations was designed to serve Britain. And the Allies, basically, the United States, France, and all the countries of Britain and America, basically. Um, the United Kingdom government attaches great importance to the principle and the right of self-determination as set out in Article 1.2 of the Charter of the United Nations and Article 1 of the International Co Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, uh, respectively. So it's kind of trying to grab a big area. The United Nations created the the um, the Committee for Non-Self-Governing Territories, or I, I forget the exact names, but the whole area, the whole political area of the United Nations that has to do with um, seeking the independence of ex-colonies was created because we humanity politically started understanding that it was completely unfair what, for example, Britain did to India and Cambodia and Africa and, you know, and so, and, and the Spanish, well, before them, um, France or America with other islands and territories. And so the United Nations created said, we're going to be fair. We recognize that empires have no right to take land from people, to take land that was did not belong to them. And they called it the Committee for so something Non-Self-Governing Territories, right? And then Britain names itself as the administrating country of said territory. It's almost like um, using the United Nations to administrate the release of colonies as I, in, in the time and the manner in which empires well pleased to do so. Because they named themselves the, the authors of the intention of, 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 of uh, they they are the administrators, and so they agree that they want to be good and no longer be rulers, empire, uh, ruthless rulers. So they can they transform like Britain does, transform this into territories that start saying, well, you know, we're okay with <laughs> with Britain ruling us. How how why would it's like a a distortion, a perversion. The Falkland Islands, the people that are on the Malvinas Islands, the Falkland Islanders, were never not British. They were never not people that came from England. Uh, there are other immigrants, but they never went there to start something new and create their own country. They never escaped from anywhere, like the colonies in America. Um, they were there from the beginning as an outpost of the British. But the British transformed and, you know, painted that definition to make it look as if they are their own purpose. They 
are there because they wanted something for themselves. And yet you talk to the to the islanders and really they don't want, they will tell you themselves, they don't want to be independent. Now, nonetheless, they use this call for non-independence, for wanting to continue uh, to be under the United Kingdom as their own call of uh, a spontaneous uh, free call to, to live that way. They want to be a maid. They want to, they want to be an employee. They, they say that they want to maintain that and as if this had nothing to do with Britain finding a way to not have Argentina involved in the history of these islands. So it's something that occurs just between them. It's a little hard to explain, but the trick, the cheating is, is quite obvious. And they do the same thing with Gibraltar. It's not difficult for a country like Britain to maintain a tiny little population in a place like Gibraltar or, or Malvinas, satisfied, content, without problems, uh, secured, guaranteed to be afloat and away from any serious uh, pressure that would, uh, that would grip the, the population of a country that tried to survive on its own in this world. In fact, all the, they will finance and build the infrastructure and, you know, create all these political connections and liaisons that lead to a fishery, to a fish industry and, uh, the offer of overseas oil exploitation. And then they go, uh, exploration for an oil industry. And then they have the islanders say, we did this on our own. We created our own fishing industry and we created our own oil industry. And look at how wonderful our little country is. All the things that we can do. We're so rich. We're the richest. Oh, and how did you achieve that? How did 3,000 people achieve that? And, and, you know, and since basically if you go back to the day 1982, they were a little more than farmers. <laughs> there weren't any any fishing licenses to Spain and South Korea and you know all that was done in order to beat the uh to beat the Argentinians and um would it be in Britain's best interest if Argentina continues to struggle economically uh if the prize was the the islands the Falkland Islands and what it could produce as far as oil and everything that they want to build, the South Atlantic Empire, <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, some people believe that. Some people believe that it is the best, in a, the, the silent interest of America and Britain to keep Latin American nations struggling and just about to grab the carrot when all of a sudden they pull the, the rug from underneath them uh, in ways that are unseen, like they, you know, like they attacked Lula um, through American lawyers, and you know, there's a lot that goes on that we don't see in, in our in our headlines. So it continues to say the United Kingdom government attaches great importance to the principle, blah 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 blah. Right? It wants to say that. They're only doing it to uh, give them the right. But, you know, the non-self-governing territories, uh, the article of self-determination to do with these territories were created for countries that were, uh, people that were invaded, that already had a country going. This is the, the main reason this part of the United Nations exists, is for countries that were usurped. And so the United Nations proposes to be an instrument of liberation. What the British are doing is using that to endow the Falkland Islanders with a right of the same category, of the same caliber as such other situations in the world. Why don't they uh, just as vehemently apply it to Diego Garcia or Cyprus? 
you know, they, they, they are more interested in applying it to the Falcon Islands because it's a vehicle. It's a political vehicle by which they can use the Islanders as a political human shield and confuse the Argentinians because the Argentinians still talk about a colony that needs to be decolonized, but there were never, there were Argentinians there that, that were sent back to Argentina or got absorbed by the British. And there were such few of them. In reality, what the Falkland Islands or the Malvinas Islands uh, political description is, is an usurpation of the Argentine territory because the Argentinians had included that in the forming of their republic, which started taking shape in 1810. By 1820, they said these are, they reminded everybody, send somebody over there and let's include the Malvinas while we're working on our constitution. By 1830, they, it was well understood that the Malvinas were going to be part of Argentina which already had declared its independence in 1816. And so when the British took the, uh, you know, attacked, peace, uh, light, <laughs> light attacked, softly attacked, and ordered the, the um, whoever was there at the moment to lower the Argentine flag and, and raise the British flag, it was an invasion of Argentine territory. The Malvinas, or the Falklands, was never a colonial situation. It never was a colonial situation. <laughs> it's a situation in which Britain grabbed a part of Argentina that was very badly defended, that was across the water, so they couldn't just send an army. They, they took something that was easy to grab from Argentina. It never was turned into a colony, they they put a, a governing office, as you would an outpost, not a, a, a territory that you're that used to belong to somebody else, and now you're administrating them because you conquered or invaded them or something. No, they created a Falcon Islands office and had people that they called not quite. They called them colon colonists or something at first, and then they turned them into citizens. Might as well just be be sincere, you know. But at first, they called them colonists or settlers or something, and and they weren't exactly British citizens, but they were of they weren't their own people. They were always an extension of Britain. So this is where the three cups game plays in. They can say through such a condition that they are uh, their own people. And so, hey, I wash my hands. They want to be free. They, the islands belong to them. You know, <laughs> no. Why don't they, they, what they should be saying was we put them there and now we're asking them to say that they want to stay there. <laughs> that is the truth. And they want to stay in a place that we took from Argentina. But these letters don't reflect that at all. They paint something that uses the structure of the United Nations to make it appear like a different, a different, completely different narrative. And they don't mention anything that the Argentinians are well, well versed in, partly to blame are the Argentinians themselves that don't know how to, how to more, uh, extrovertedly in the political arena, in the international political arena, explain what really happened there, describe to the world, to the medias, to the, the, the venues of communication to the world, what really happened there in 18, between 1820 and 1833. Um, let's see, where else are we? Social economic future, you should okay. As such, the United Kingdom remains committed to defending the rights of the people of Falkland Islands to determine their own political, social, economic future. Of course, this sounds all wonderful to the to to people that don't know anything, people that don't know really how this conflict came to be, in an objective description of it, without any self-invested interest in it, which excludes the United States because the United States basically repeats the British narrative 
um, and makes it seem like they're championing freedom and democracy uh, through the United Nations for the poor islanders that are victims of Argentina, when in reality the, the islanders are just basically in cahoots with the British, no, not wanting to talk about anything. They don't want no one. They don't want to talk about anything. They don't want to negotiate. They don't want to. They don't want to talk about it. <laughs> you know, when you when you take something, or when somebody claims that you took something that belongs to them, and you wonder if it's true that you maybe didn't know it belonged to them, and you ended up taking it anyways, you have a sense of a conscientious sense that maybe there could that there is possibility that that such that is true. And somebody keeps bugging you saying, okay, listen, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about what happened that day. You're going to be res resistant to want to go back and talk about what the real sentiment was and why you felt that didn't belong to anybody and you just took it, for example. Because there's you risk the possibility of the other person proving that indeed it was theirs and you lose that object. And this is basically why Britain does not want to publicly, they want to put the argument in a contained and controlled environment that they themselves designed, <laughs> you know, the United Nations with all its its own vocabulary, legal, political uh, principles, vocabulary, and the International Court of Justice. And, uh, you know, it's obvious, for example, I mean, these are not bodies that are actually establishing justice per the essence, the humanist, true, real human uh, essence of the, of the matter. Because if that were the case, the northern bit of Chile would have been returned to Bolivia. It was, the Chileans flagrant, flagrantly just stole that territory from Bolivia. It was never Chilean. They themselves will say it. That was Bolivia. If you look at an old map, it says Bolivia. But, you know, they couldn't, they had to go over the mountains to defend that little, or to be, uh, to develop that part of the seashore. So they let the Chileans establish commerce and salt mines, and then the British, of course, were interested in that as well. And they warred against the poor Bolivians. They, they were, they were, you know, they, they were poorer then with the help of the British, <laughs> you know, on top of it. And they said, okay, now it's ours. So what the hell does the International Court of Justice exist for if it can't do justice on something that is flagrantly obvious? You know, because they say, well, Bolivia conceded. Well, yeah, just like. Spain conceded to uh, a treaty that where they gave Gibraltar to. They didn't really give it. What they wanted was peace. They, they wanted to stop fighting. They had no more, no more, uh, you know, and, and Britain did the same thing with Argentina. Uh, Britain, at least that I know of, I mean, I'm sure many countries have done the same thing throughout human history. But basically what they do is they they blackmail countries into to, uh, peace and said, so we'll give you peace. We'll stop attacking you. We'll stop this war in exchange for Gibraltar. And if, if since we won Malvinas, you now have to only do business with us. You have to tell us everything that you do militarily in the South Atlantic. The Madrid Treaty is like what we call it, the Argentinian Versailles Treaty. You know, completely subduing, abusive, tyrannical, um, fear-based, um, greedy agreement that kept Germany oppressed and which is what motivated Hitler to rise. And this has already happened in history, but I guess it works, right? Because they did that to Argentina after Argentina uh lost a war that it was never going to win. They didn't want to go into that war. Um, the, that was the general's idea that 
the Argentinian people who have never even imagined anything that would vaguely have any military tone against Britain. Britain was like their their cultural cousin. They were proud of having British things in the country and that the British built their really they thought of themselves as as informal allies and friends with the British. They would have never wanted to war over the Malvinas over even though they never stopped claiming the Malvinas. Um so when, when the junta invaded the islands to take them back, to flare up the dispute, what Britain did was immediately it called it not a resuscitation of a, of a, of a dormant conflict in a dispute over islands that dates back to 1833. It called it an invasion of British territory by the Argentinians. It took advantage, along with the United States, that it dominates the medias to inform the world that the Argentinians are this aggressive, another yet another aggressive country that attacks the noble, democratic, free-loving nations of, thank goodness we're powerful and have nuclear weapons that we can establish righteous justice, right? So we have to say that the Argentinians, why didn't the British say, uh, you know, we're not going to resolve this with through a war. Let's talk about war. Why didn't the British say, uh, let's find a peaceful resolution to this? The British never, never in 19, 1982 said, we wait. Uh, we don't want a war. We don't want to attack you. We want to, let's find a peaceful resolution to this. No, no, no. They were in 13 days. They were there. And it's for many facts and things that we know today, we know that they already knew that the Junta was planning this. And what could be more convenient to America and to British that the foolish Junta would think that they could take the islands because the British somehow will not retaliate militarily? Would militarily trained people actually think that? Or were they maybe informed by very informal means. We don't think the British are going to attack. Don't do this. Don't do this because... And then after they were already on their way, maybe Haig from the United States or Reagan told Haig to tell the junta, don't do this because, you know, we, the British are going to... When it was too late, <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time that people manipulate each other to get somebody going and then after the fact make it seem like they really never wanted a war to happen but the fact is that the british never asked for an end to the to the conflict to to find a peaceful resolution they were this was their big chance to scare the islanders into thinking that they have an enemy across the ocean they they knew the argentinians claimed the islands They've always known. The islanders from the first islander that got to those islands knew uh, that the Argentinians have been claiming these islands since 1820. But such was the relationship and the passivity of the Argentinians that they never really felt threatened. I mean, the Argentinians did a couple of silly things. Like one time they, they, uh, they landed a plane, a uh, plane, uh, a commercial flight, you know, another time a boat got over, you know, went there. and But really, they were, there wasn't, obviously, the British didn't take him too seriously. Um, they never thought it, because that wasn't what the relationship between these two countries was about. What the junta did was absolutely extraordinarily freakish. And that's why many people think that it, Something made them do it. Something, you know, compelled them or made them believe that the British were just going to really try to negotiate and not want to war. <laughs> they could not have been wronger. They were completely fooled. The British, as soon as the junta landed, they were ready. They got it, they got it all together in, in 12 days. 
and they make it seem like it was hard, you know, and they really went out on a limb and, and maybe they weren't going to win. It was, it's all a big lie. The British and the Americans knew they were going to win the Argentinians. Duh. The Argentinians could not have lasted more than four months with the ammunition they had. And if they, by whatever freakish chance, the Argentinians succeeded in sinking the the invincible aircraft carrier or what have you, they had plans. They were going, they were even considering dropping nuclear weapons on one, some Argentine city. And, you know, they weren't going there to lose or, or to see what happened. They were going there because they knew it was a war that would provide a victory after which they had plans they could carry out in the South Atlantic and regarding Argentina and Chile and that whole part of the world. <laughs> um, of course, this is not what, what you're told, what, as they say, what they teach you in school. You know, this is not how uh, things are. There are people that are talking about it, writing books and and giving seminars. But as always, what is told in the national news networks and what you learn by researching and digging and and listening to other types of reporting and other types of investigation, though it's closer to the truth, is not what the majority of people learn about uh, what describes so many conflicts in the world. Um, let's try to wrap this up. As such as the king... Uh, as such, the United Kingdom remains committed to defending... Uh, the United Kingdom rejects the statement by the Argentine government that these developments are contrary to General Assembly Resolution of uh, 3149-31 uh, and reiterates... Of course, because some Argentinians, some poli pol American, uh, Argentinian politicians and other politicians on behalf of Argentina are trying to explain that the, the United Nations is being used pervertedly uh, as if the population of the islands was a colonial situation that the British must defend for their own sake because they are independent and sovereign and free like would be any other the basis for understanding any other non-self-governing ex-colony whatever territory in the world and reason for which these articles were created in the united nations the it was britain itself that brought the conflict to the united nations declaring itself the administrator or the ex what would be the ex-colonial power right why? Because that's how it could dominate the situation. It can use all of these um, diplomatic mechanisms regarding ex-colonies and non-self-governing territory, the right to self-determination and what have you, uh, under, its, under its control. It could put everything into, in its own console and leave the Argentinians out of it. In fact, of writing the Argentinians out of the equation because the Argentinians never presented in the United Nations an argument that said Britain attacked and took part of our territory. They attacked us, <laughs> a, a, a part that we had incorporated into our nation and took it from us as, a, as an international conflict. Um, in Argentina, you do hear people say we are being occupied, we have been invaded, part of our territory is, is, is occupied. But only within Argentina, Uruguay, and, you know, and some Spanish-speaking forums, you hear something that sounds closer to the truth. The world dominated by the English language, the British and American narratives, which is the 90 95% of the literature that would have that would be written about these islands tell the story that is that sounds best to the british you know that they're the good guys they're not they're not a empire that <laughs> feels that they can take as much of the world as they want to and if you don't like it tough they're stronger <laughs> they're richer and you need them economically they don't they don't present themselves that way they they try to make it seem as if the world is trying to be organized and they really want the world to be organized but 
by the methods of democracy and freedom and human values and you know um okay the Argentine domestic and very fault has developed their own natural okay government and developed contrary to general resolution thirty one slash forty nine and reiterates its unequivocal support for the right of the Falcon Islanders to develop their natural resources for their own economic benefits. The nerve! The nerve! It's unbelievable! <laughs> they just little stone-faced lie in your face. They built all of these, all, like I said before, they built all this, all this stuff for the Islanders so that they can later say, hey, it's our industry. And, you know, look at the Argentinians are trying to rob our fisheries, our oil industry. And, and so Britain presents it that way through this language of values and principles, political diplomatic principles, um, for the benefit of uh, anyone who, would, who believes that things are being done righteously through the United Nations. Argentine domestic law, including the three laws passed in 2020, does not apply to the Falkland Islands. Well, they can say that because they can say they can say whatever they want. They can say, you know, this this is our sovereign land. They can they can never once mention that it was, uh, you know, a territory they stole from another country or that they're trying they're still trying to finagle and take because everything that britain does is characterized in essence by the intention of continuing to take continuing to rob continuing to win over and beat the argentinians at being right about this they're they're still robbing the islands it's that's what's so incredible about this old conflict is that all of this stuff is it's bullshit. It's not true. It's just the language of, of principles and values that they want the people who believe in the United Nations to go by. But when you see why they actually do all this stuff, what you see is a country that is still pulling. It's still pulling. It's still trying to take these islands from... You know, Argentinians basically don't do anything. You know, they just kind of like now they're every once in a while they act up a little bit more. But they always felt, hey, you know, these islands are have always been part of the country from from when from our conception. We only know in Argentina that was born with these islands. And they're right there. They're right across the ocean. There's no other country that is close to these islands but us. So their their human perspective is very different. And it's characterized by a nonchalant kind of true, genuine, indignant innocence. Like they're uh, they're just angry that Britain can take it only because it's more powerful and rich and has a, a strong military and can influence countries and blackmail countries to either buy their version, not be Argentina's friend or not be my friend. If you're going to take the Argentinian side, they can do all that stuff and, and with the power they have in the world, but the Argentinians can't. And yet, when you go to Argentina, you see how the spirit and how it is, how the Malvinas are felt. You won't find a single gram, a single ounce anywhere in the country of anything that would hint, you know, we decided to have these islands after the fact. We wanted to see if we could take them from the British. You know, that doesn't exist. That's never been part of, of of the truth that these the history of these islands are regarding the Spanish Empire and South America and the creation of Argentina. Yet Britain wants you to believe that. Britain wants you to believe that it's actually it's like projection. Yeah, it's like the psychological. They actually, you can see through their words that it's them who's trying to forge something, not the Argentinians. <laughs> and yet they make it, they continue to repeat themselves like the Argentinians are trying to forge something. Um, uh, 
the Republic of Argentina regular refers to, regularly refers to regional statements of diplomatic support for sovereignty negotiations. Well, actually, a lot of countries do it on their own. Uh, the, whatever, the League of African Nations or the 77, uh, you know, the other 77% of the world organization, whatever, Alliance of Nations in South America and uh, the OAS, I think that sometimes it did. So in any case, uh, side with basically what is sen sensible, that two countries talk about it. <laughs> now, let's see what it says, because there's absolutely nothing wrong with two countries talking openly in front of everybody about something that we claim to be right about. Why wouldn't you want more people to be in on it and, and know and understand better what's going on and negotiate openly? Why do you want to say, we don't want to talk or let's put it hidden behind doors in and, and, and the ICG, ICJ or United Nations, whatever. Um, However, none of these modifiers dilute the obligation on states to respect the legality binding unless binding principle of self-determination. Okay, however, none of these modify or dilute the obligation on states to respect the legally binding principle of self-determination. Yeah, because they, they really they really want to grab on to that. They really want to put all their eggs in the basket of the rights of the United the um, the Islanders, because this was their strategy from the very beginning. That they since 1845, when they brought the Islanders, this is how we're going to do it, you know. And eventually, that got more sophisticated. And but they were already looking at how you know other territories, how this was working for them with other territories, in some places more successfully, in other places less successfully. But basically, this is the model. We play this game, the three, I call it the three Napolitan cups. You know, you move it, what, which cup is the ball under? Which cup is the ball under? It's basically a trick. And that you can fool the spectators. If you ever watched how the Napolitans in Porta Portese in Rome uh, steal money from people, I was suckered into it myself, actually. I lost $200. Because when you're the audience... You look at the at the ability of them moving the cups around and you think you're convinced that you know where the little ball is under. And so you courageously jump in. The people that listen to the news, that hear the statements of Britain before the United Nations regarding the referendum of self-determination of 2013 and all this stuff, are the spectators of the of the three cups game. And they, they say, well, I can see how it makes sense. I can see how it makes sense. I have something to say, which is the equivalent of jumping in and, and, and waging some money. <laughs> you know, uh, wage some money and say, say to Britain, okay, well, why don't you have open talks with Argentinian diplomats and politicians in different channels around the world or... You know, why do you, why do you want to hide about this? Why do you want to paint so hard? You know, they work so hard. Pamphlets, tourist things, you know, what they name stuff, programs that go visit Antarctica, um, you know, it's just tons of, and then uh, the events, you know, the sports representing the Falklands with its own little flag and, you know, sports events. They work so hard at creating this narrative. Of the little, the little, the little country in the South Atlantic that Britain defends, you know. Um, but really, they should just do what all these countries say, which is okay. Have negotiations, talk about it, resolve the dispute. Why doesn't Britain want to resolve disputes? This is why. I, why does it want to? How come these disputes go on? a territory situation in Antarctica and Cyprus. And if it was Hong Kong, you know, Chinese were strong and wise and they, they handled that beautifully. Uh, but if it, if it hadn't been China and it had been Argentina, believe me, Hong Kong would be 
uh, would still be a British overseas territory. Um, how come these, these don't go away? Why does why does it seem that Britain is more interested in maintaining these confrontations, these situations? What other country in the world? America has territories and whatever overseas territories, but you know there's situations that are weak. That frankly, some of these people would rather, you know, are so small. You know, some terrorists, some islands in the Pacific. They're so small, they're about to be covered by the ocean, you know. You have Puerto Rico, which is, you know, for so long, so many generations have uh, have grown believing they were part of America. You know, there's a national... But it's not the same as Britain. Uh, when it comes to Gibraltar and Spain, Malvinas and Argentina, Cyprus... Um, and other places, Diego Garcia is blatant. The, it's just blatant. It's almost as bad as Chile taking part of Bolivia. You know, they don't care. They don't care because nobody else cares. These people go and say, you know, give us, take us back to our islands. Well, now America is there. America has it. So try to move an American base from that little atoll. But other than that, conflicts like the Malvinas Falklands, you know, you look at Antarctica and you see Argentina and Chile dip all the way, almost touching Antarctica. It's two thirds as close as what New Zealand, one third or something, one third closer, two thirds, clo no, one third closer, more than one third, like three fifths or something, three fifths closer to the Antarctica con continent, the continent of Antarctica than New Zealand is. Britain has the Commonwealth, you know, the, they're all in, on, in cahoots. They understand that the Commonwealth is a way of staying strong militarily and economically in the world. And, you know, they, now it's led to the idea of the, the five whatever, pent <laughs> the five countries that speak English, you know, they uh, created a good whatever intelligence network. Um, so... Considering how much monopoly they have already over the world, the English-speaking world in Britain, still they they feel that one third of Antarctica uh, for the Commonwealth is not enough. They have to have nearly all of it. Not only do they feel they need they need to have nearly all of it. But they feel they can't move over a little bit and let Argentina have its claim. You know, it, it drew its lines from the, the extent of its own. It's not trying to grab more of the world than what's some, something that appears logical to it. Chile did the same thing. It drew lines straight from its own borders down to the South Pole. So Britain cannot move over. And, and and take maybe one fourth of Antarctica east of the Argentinian claim. It has to overlap the Argentinian claim. This is what's fascinating to me because you can see how these countries use confrontation to take from weaker situations or opportuni opportunistically from weaker countries. Because when you argue and bully against somebody that continues to confront you instead of looking, you know, looking the other way. We can't go anywhere else on the planet. We're stuck on this planet together. That bully, if they want something that the weaker person has, can continue to fester and, 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 and keep that situation aggravated so that that the weaker one who wants peace like all of us do. We all want to go back to peace. We all want to end wars, except Britain, <laughs> except Britain and America. Um, we'll eventually con concede, fine, you know, fine, take it. Just get out of my hair. And so it seems that that's what Britain exploits. 
It wants to create confrontation. It wants to see that. It thrives through war, through confrontation, through maintaining an antagonistic border. And I've always kind of understood that, and I always felt, what would be of Britain if it all of a sudden it had no more? What would happen to England, to Britain, to United, if it had no more problems with Northern Ireland, with Scotland, with Cyprus, with Malvinas, with, you know, wherever, Afghanistan, Iraq, or, you know, Belize. When have all this disappeared? And it just said, have it all. Just have it. We don't, we're not going to fight anymore. We're just going to concentrate on ourselves. What would happen to Britain? Well, if it, if they did it that way, probably something very beautiful. But I doubt that they would just turn on a dime and it would be that one day to the next. Um, additionally, the government of Argentina regularly refers to the military presence in the Falkland Islands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you seen this play? Have you seen their military base? It's, 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 it's crazy. It's like it, it needs to be in Baghdad. Why did, why do they have such a, do you know, do you know how strong, how modern and how well equipped and how well trained the Argentinian military is? It's nowhere even close to how little it was already back in 1982. It's much less capable than 1982. In fact, the Argentinian military immediately became less capable. They became not proud and bitter, scorned, wanting to seek revenge after the war. They turned in on themselves. They were ashamed and angry at the same time. And they, they started bullying all, all their police officers and all of their, the, the military is a disgrace. You would think that Britain said, well, understandable, let's take advantage of that situation to explain to the islanders that this happened because of a crazed junta, because it is, after all, in the best interest of the islanders for them to have a good relationship with Argentina, whatever the political shape or the territorial shape of that is, they need to be in good rapport with the continent in order to thrive and build the kind of country that they want to have. If they, in fact, what Britain wants is for them to have a country. But of course, that's not what Britain did. Britain immediately proceeded to build a huge military base, submarines, ships, you know, there's as many soldiers. What is it? There's like, I don't know if there's something like 2,800 islanders and 1,000 soldiers. And yet they want to have the United Nations believe that this is a self-governing territory with its own, with creating its own uh, venues, national venues of sustenance, while they have 1,000 British soldiers for no reason. To intim there is a reason, of course. Is to intimidate Argentina, to to psychologically influence, um, and Britain is, is is huge on on the psychological explanation of military activity and war and and how uh, what is done after a war. There's a whole psychological. Um, uh, structure, a scheme behind it. Um, and who knows if, you know, just to, just to be sure, you know, just to make sure, because I mean, after all, look at how things developed. If you're a country that seeks to fight, you will provoke eventually uh, military aggression to, to be cultivated in a place. So often you see Argentinians, poorly thinking Argentinians, uh, Argentinians that are not too whatever, to go and say, well, you know, we're going to, we should get closer to the Chinese and closer to the Russians, provoked by the hostility they feel from the British coming from the islands. Unprovoked hostility. And all the training and everything that happens on that military base on the Falkland Islands 
is all about Argentina. I mean, they are they train, they have uh, theory of uh, hypothesis of war with Argentina and what they would do if Argentina tried. And you know, Argentina doesn't even have anything of that nature. They don't train to invade the islands. They don't train to defend themselves from. They should. <laughs> they should train to defend themselves from the British. And the Americans, all of Latin America should always be training because, after all, the only enemies Latin America and Hispanic America has are the Anglos. America and the British are the only countries that have ever shown hostility, invasive, conniving, manipulative policy, strategy, military intervention, military planning against them have been America and Britain. So it stands to reason that if you're any Hispanic Republic, you should be prepared, just in case, to defend yourself from a British or an American nation. Yet none of them do. And yet they are talked about with condescendence, with... Um, patronizing, disdain, with irreverence, regarded completely as unequal, unimportant countries, you know. It's just such a despicable, disgraceful, shameful situation happening there between Hispanic America and the Anglo world. Uh, it makes no sense. It's humiliating, humiliating for both sides. Because if you really analyze, uh, if you analyze, for example, and you think about why a bully is being aggressive or bossy even to whatever, the weakling of the class, and you make it evident to that bully before the whole class, what has that guy ever done to you? It's embarrassing for the bully. It's not just, it's not only humiliating for Hispanic republics, uh, but we don't we don't see it there, do we? We see the narratives that are being spun in uh, you know networks, news networks, and the United Nations letters by Britain. <laughs> uh, the United Kingdom forces in the South Atlantic are entirely defensive against what? <laughs> They're entirely defensive. Def yeah, defensive against what? Who's nearby that poses a problem? Chile? Uruguay? Argentina? South Africa? Antarctica. Must be Antarctica. Must be the, must be the aliens under uh, the continent in Antarctica. Good thinking. And are, and are at the appropriate level, no, lie. I mean, this letter is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It is at a completely disappropriate, disproportional, exorbitantly ridiculous level of, of military capacity. Yet it says, and are at the appropriate level to ensure the defense of the Falcon Islands against any potential threat. And which would be those potential threats? Which are those? Say them. List. Let make a list. Explain the potential threats. We all want to know. In fact, the uh, United Kingdom's military presence has significantly reduced over time. <laughs> and then it goes back. <laughs> Somewhere in their mind is a conscious awareness of of, of what the world might perceive. Uh, might intuitively see to be the actual truth. And so it just covers both bases and says, in fact, the United Kingdom's military presence has significantly reduced over time. The United Kingdom continues to keep its force levels under review. So we're not aggressive, okay? We're still looking to see if maybe we have, we're, we have too many, too much of a military presence there. So, you know... Always trying to fool the United Nations. We want peace, but in reality, they're maintaining the world at war. 
and formalizing it through the organisms of the United Nations, the conventions in Geneva, this and that. Okay, we can war as long as we only blow bombs in these circumstances, and only as long as you don't put mines here or there. Okay, good. So we can continue warring as long as we follow these rules. The United Kingdom, and, and yet they say the United Nations was created to end wars in the world. And the United Nations has done nothing. I mean, what the United Nations does is it mediates, it, it, it attenuates, it kind of amalgamates a little bit situations for, to, in the service of the powers, the military powers that can land and, and start slowly disarming these situations in a, in a convenient manner to them, in a way that favors them. So it's like they call the shots. The, the military powers say, okay, we'll make it seem like the United Nations is brokering peace here. But really what is happening is that they allow peace to happen. So as long as this person gets is moved out of the way, sometimes, sometimes they don't care and they just murder <laughs> people, you know. They just hang presidents and, you know. But, you know, still you can always resort to using the United Nations to continue fooling the world uh, that somehow these good allies have uh, created an instrument that intends to bring peace eventually someday, they say, to the world. In reality, it's an instrument to formalize a behavior that they can continue, through which they can continue manipulating the belligerent situations that they're governing, that they're, they're responsible for. <laughs> you know, they started and then they, they, they created the problem in Iran with Britain and America trying to put their companies to, you know, take their oil and, and, and share it with the people in power that they were more interested in ruling Iran. And then when those, when the country said, no, wait, we want to have our own oil, all of a sudden Britain and America said, well, we're not your friends anymore. Because really, we wanted that oil for us. Be, and we wanted you to believe that some of it was for you through you having certain leaders that were convenient for us so that we could continue taking your oil. But we don't want to talk about all of that, right? We just want it to go away and now make it seem like these wars are righteous about our country, uh, you know, we're defending our country and we're defending values uh, and principles and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and everybody's buying it. <laughs> everybody's buying it. Well, not actually not everybody, but what can people do? That's the big tragedy. You know, today with as much communication as we have, an enormous chunk of the world population knows narratives that are closer to the truth. But, you know, you get to a point where those that have the power have the power and there's nothing that... Democ democracy is also kind of not true, you know. They give us the people that they want us to choose among. And we're also talking about that and maybe change eventually will come to future generations. Um because we are becoming more intelligent as societies and we're talking more about what is really going on and not going on as they would have us believe believe is and that does lead eventually to younger generations with truer a truer narrative arriving to places of power ultimately who knows what will happen um and finally the united kingdom and the falcon islands government Again, it, it capitulates. It ends with a make sure that you understand there's two elements here, one of which are people with their own right to self determination. You're going to remain willing to discuss areas of mutual interest in the South Atlantic. What? Remain willing to discuss areas of mutual interest of South Atlantic with the precondition that representatives of the Falkland Islands government must participate in any discussions of issues that affect the Falkland Sea. They, and what they want is for this 
lie to become real. That has always been British policy. The, the, they fake it, fake it, fake it until you make it. You know, make this about some kind of people that create their own, they have their own, endowed with their own right to self-determination. And so they're telling the United Nations, you know, and really what we want is progress for them. And they, we want them to create their own progress. And so they, what they want is to completely move aside Argentina's historical truth about the islands and the truth about the Spanish Empire's uh, unwitting bequeathment or unwill, un, un, how do you say, when you don't actually effect it, effectuate it formally. You know, the Spanish left basically the Malvinas in the laps of the Argentinians. It wasn't an, an, an official inheritance, but they, you know, they gave birth to their nation with the islands as part of their territory. And so that whole part of history that would explain this and what the, and how the British in truth behaved and everything that the British in reality did to the Argentinians, to Uruguay, uh, in Paraguay, in Chile, in Patagonia, and with the Malvinas, and the Spanish Empire, and the South America, all of that, which is all part of the same narrative regarding, you know, the British first tried to take Buenos Aires, that didn't work. Uh, then So then they went and took Malvinas. It's all so militarily logistic. It's all about, you know, we want to control this part of the world. If they could, they would, they would find reasons to think that Argentina, you know, can be invaded and should belong to them. And, you know, if you're Argentinian and you understand in detail the whole history with England since, since the 1800s, a lot of people kind of feel like it's, like it's like this monster that's gnarling at you from, from behind and you can't quite see it. Like it, it really wants that. It wants to have Antarctica, Malvinas, Patagonia, the, all the resources, the South Atlantic. This, you know, it, it still acts towards this part of the world as it did towards India and Africa when it was an empire. It feels like it can still get away with playing the part, the political part of dynamics and, 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 and um, reasons or, or policy that it once had for these long gone possessions against a place where there's little resistance. You know, it has the, the, these people on the islands in cahoots trying to, you know, cheering on. Yep, 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 we'll do whatever you say. Well, Argentina, bad, bad, bad. We're afraid of them. And, you know, they're, they don't love us. They don't respect us. They hate us. And, you know, and they have the island. And they, they have some, are the odd Argentinian, which is completely crazy that thinks that wishes it would be a British country, you know, because none of Hispanic America has enough self-love and 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 self-imagination to in all integrity break away from comparing themselves or thinking that they need to catch up and make their own nations and the general weakness the, the general need of governments that regularly come into power that say well you know let's let's deal with the americans let's deal with europe and england and you know we need the dollar dominates whatever, their, their banks, as it is in most of the world. And so there's that. It all allows for Britain to continue having an attitude and a policy towards the South Atlantic, which basically means Argentina more than it means Africa, uh, as it does, as it does. And when you read such letters... Um, when you read letters like this, you really see almost the how un, unable to perceive itself the British are, how unable to perceive them their own behavior. When you see the presentations uh, like they had uh, on Zoom with the Falcon Islanders and some British ministries not too long ago, 
Um, and they talk about, you know, we got to protect this from China moving in as if it was their backyard, as if it was something that, that they have a right to. And Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, these countries don't, eh, they happen to be there. No, it's, it's not their right to be first and foremost entitled to being concerned, doing or not doing about something about the Chinese, you know, moving into the South Atlantic. It's London's concern, according to the British. Uh, and that's what they say blatantly. They want to strengthen uh, the role of the, of the Falkland Islands government in this part of the world for. And so they say it blatantly in internet conferences. And so when you hear this stuff, you, you see that they don't actually see themselves for how they are behaving in the world and how they're treating other countries in the world or how they think of the rest of the countries in the world, how they have a complete absence of notion that all countries are equally entitled to the planet. All nations have the same right to exist and to speak up and to um, put their two cents towards the future of the world. That whole part that some countries, the smaller countries, kind of naturally and humanly uh, live and think by, the British don't. <laughs> the British continue to think that they're <laughs> that they're still like the number one power of the world, you know. And and the thing is that they made a transition because had Germany won uh, the war, of course, all that would have ended. But instead, what happened is that the most powerful and richest country in the world, the United States, became and then got an agreement. And so they transitioned, and they're able to continue. Well, the United States, and they said, well, you know, we'll give America the role of being the muscle, the bully. And we'll just be the quiet little mousy brain behind it. We'll come off as being the more uh, controlled, more contained, more civilized, more rational, uh, less pretentious. Well, to the international forum, it's like America is the one that invades with its armies and and has the world under black the blackmail of its well now it's russia china and their nuclear weapons um and england and pakistan and you know and the, they subscribe to the the fear policy along with the united states um to match the united states that's you know hostility and belligerency breathes or fosters hostility and violence and more belligerency. So if we want to bring peace to the world, we have to say we want peace. <laughs> what can, you know, will a peace treaty that says we'll only have 10,000 nuclear weapons, if you only have 10,000 nuclear weapons, is the same as nothing. You have to say to all countries, we want a treaty that every year we destroy uh, a certain number of nuclear weapons and in 20 years we invite these other countries to join and start destroying their nuclear weapons so that we can also then eventually come to re uh, reducing the number of armies and consciously uh, restraining ourselves from war and pulling back from wars and it has to be a whole big comprehensive, far-reaching, extending into the future global plan to bring peace to the world. Uh, obviously, war is working. Aggressive, hostility, fear, fear, suggestion, and intimidation is working for the rich countries of the world. Obviously, otherwise, they would... Um, we would all be closer to the human sense in us that would prefer peace than to be beating each other up every day and does very much prefer to go there. But okay, this is leading somewhere else. 
Thanks for listening. And I'm looking forward to your comments. Ciao.